Welcome back to the channel, uh, vlog number six today. Finishing up the end of a progression this week as I deload and then uh, head into an eight or nine week prep for national. So excited about that. Quick, quick announcements. Um, early tomorrow we'll be putting out the TSA updated intermediate approach. Um, really excited about that. That is free, no email, um, you know, no download or anything like that. You can just go and click and get that. So if you're looking for a solid approach for powerlifting um, and you're an intermediate athlete, you've competed for maybe two years or something like that, this would be a really good approach for you. Um, if you're a beginner athlete, we have an approach for you as well. That's also available free on the website at thestrengthathlete.com. Hope you guys are having a good weekend and enjoy the rest of the vlog. Take care. Yo, all right, off to a good start day one. Uh, so the way my program is structured, I have um, essentially four week blocks. I have, um, I've got kind of three weeks of progression and one week of deload. And lately my deload has just been a drop in volume and roughly maintaining intensity um, and a little bit of a drop on some of the heavier stuff as far as intensity is concerned. But that's, that's the basic trend. So, so this week was the third week of progression. And usually when we program, um, there are rep drops across weeks. So no, no real emerging strategies approach when it comes to kind of maintaining, um, reps across weeks, we have rep drops. So I would go from like sets of five to sets of four to sets of three, uh, and intensity rises across those. So relatively basic linear periodization. Um, and my approach is undulating, which means that I'm doing different repetitions on different days and, you know, more or less following the hypertrophy power strength model from some of the daily undulating periodization from Zordos. Um, that's been a pretty effective way to program, uh, and something that, that I've picked up when programming for other people. Um, which kind of brings me to one of the main points that I wanted to talk about here. Uh, I think as an athlete and as a coach, it is easy to forget history and perspective uh, and it's easy to be biased by that lack of remembering history and perspective so this this shows itself in so many ways um, you are programming and you end up talking about or wanting to do what works for other people because it is uh, in vogue right now and it's kind of the new hotness uh, despite what has been working for you or despite what generally works for people, or despite your access to equipment, or you know, despite any number of things, you just kind of see a wave of people all wanting to do something specific and kind of want to join on that too. Um, just totally forgetting data and totally forgetting what has worked for you, or what works for people of other ages, or what works for different body structures. It's, it's hard, I think, to stay focused on yourself in the sense of specifically narrowing your gaze to what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Like it's okay to pick up ideas from other places, but I think too often many people get swept up into trends, uh, whether it's a specific exercise or training modality or whatever the case may be and end up denying some of the fundamental training principles that have built them to the place that they're, they're currently at. As coaches, there's biases everywhere too. Um, there's a bias in transferring what has worked for you as an athlete to your athletes uh, and what's worked for them. So, so basically, you will try out the things that have worked for you on athletes um, despite that maybe not being the best approach for them uh, and maybe ignoring what has worked well for you just two years in the past uh, and not now. So we have kind of like a... I mean, I don't want to make too fine a point of it, but I feel like uh, we forget a lot of what has happened very recently, you know, or, or how we went through a trend of undulating periodization or how popular 531 was or Shaco or, you know, measuring total tonnage, pH3, you know, all these different programs that have passed through. And that's just recent past. Um, and just how fully committed people were to this being the effective way to train in the moment. 
you know, and, and just where we are today and being convinced that this is the most effective way to train instead of stepping back and taking a nuanced approach and saying, these are all different ways people get strong. We need to look at principles. Uh, we need to look at actual effectiveness. We need to take a look at training data and make our decisions from there. Um, and that the moderate approach is usually the better one. Um, so there's a few other interesting biases that I want to talk about. And um, I, I had read uh, Thinking Fast and Slow a long time ago. This is a great book by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, he's a famed psychologist uh, researcher. And he's grading papers and talks about kind of the process of grading papers and wondering if he's holding a bias by grading these papers uh, in, in the sense that if someone got a poor grade on a paper and he starts to take a look at the next one, is he automatically going to take a more negative, more critical view of this next paper, even though it has nothing to do with the paper that he was just working on? So obviously there shouldn't be a transfer of information there, but you know we're humans and transfer of information does occur. Just like if you have a bad dream, there's some transfer of mood state when you wake up and you kind of have to shake some of that off. Um, I think we see some of that as coaches too. Um, you teach the cues that helped you learn a specific lift, um, but maybe you apply approach uh, that you just use on a previous athlete to another athlete, not totally removing your frame of reference. I, I think as coaches, we need to make sure that we can put ourselves in the shoes of an athlete, of their training report, of their training response, of what's worked best for them, um, kind of independently from one state to another and basically eat a little bit of ginger in between each update with athlete um, so that we have a fresh palate and we can we can just be independent uh, with athletes as we're kind of moving from case to case. So I think there's kind of inherent humanness in the coaching process. And it's not to say that like going the other direction and being totally data-based is the answer too or at least not with any approach that we've seen yet. You know, the so-called AI approaches, or at least one AI approach um, that doesn't seem to be an actual AI approach at all. Um, but AI in general, any type of AI approach has to overcome some of the same obstacles of coaching more generally and also some specific challenges when it comes to getting reproducible information, being confident that the approach that we give athletes is the right one, that it represents, you know, kind of the, the combination of the data in, in the best, most effective way. I wrote an article on this uh, not too long ago. This was kind of in response to when Juggernaut first came out with their AI approach and just got me thinking about AI more broadly. Like, I, I think that we're not too far from heading in that direction if we end up having large good data sets of training and athlete responses and I think there's some interesting uses I think that AI is pervading so many sectors of, of human life and for good reason there's just a lot uh, to be learned and to make more efficient and to get better progress from uh, over the same you know kind of amount of work otherwise it's a tool uh, but it's also a tool that needs to be used in a specific way so um, far far out of my field of expertise but uh, something i've read enough on from an armchair perspective to hopefully have a little bit of an opinion on both from the philosophy of artificial intelligence side and also from an imp implementation side so back to training uh these were some singles i was supposed to work up to five singles at rp six to eight got a little ambitious with this 405 kilo 893 single um and I, I was probably being a little hesitant and just not quite fully committed. Um, but there we have it. So, so back back into the, the theory deep dive. I guess if there's one thing that I have kind of learned over a longer period of coaching, of research, you know, across fields too, and I think kind of researching across fields and not just limiting yourself to sport and exercise science is that training is complex, uh, that individuals vary uh, in the extreme in lots of ways, uh, and that by complex I mean not only is there complex solutions sometimes, but just that there's a lot of interference and crossovers and small pieces that contribute to each other, and if you want to parse anything apart, it's usually not the case that there's just a simple answer or you know, a fix or, 
one input to one output. It's more like dozens of inputs uh, to a specific output. But anyways, um, that, that's not to say that you know we need to get bogged down in the weeds when we go to program for athletes or think about things. I think having a, a single mind when it comes to uh, technique focus, uh, you know, a single mind when it comes to programming and starting simple and only adding or modifying when we have a need to uh, is a really good way to go. You know, like we really just want to make the bare minimum changes necessary in order to see the type of progress that we're after. This goes to, you know, communication uh, with athletes, whether it's cueing or um, just talking to them and stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's really just kind of about starting small and then making the changes necessary when necessary. You know, like start off with a good approach uh, that's based on your combination of your understanding of the research, uh, your understanding of uh, yourself, your own experience as a coach and as a lifter and what you understand about the lifter. Combine that with conversations with the athlete and, and ultimately end up with something that is a good starting point. Once you have that, Modify it over time based on training response and and uh, the athlete and working with the athlete. Um, yeah, I think too often we can get bogged down by the new or biased by history and just looking at a narrow slice of the present. So that, that was really my main point that I wanted to talk about this time. Finishing up day five here, some awesome uh, squats, working up to 645 double, which is a good place to finish. Um, I'm hoping this will be about week three of the next training cycle so that uh, I've got some room to kind of progress. I'd like to finish off with something confident north of 300 kilos, 660 before uh, competition and have that move really fast. That'll give me a lot of confidence on squats, uh, which is kind of one of the main things. I'm looking forward to focusing on some grip work as well. So I am positive that heavy holds will be in my near future just to make sure that uh, my hands can hold on to what the rest of me can lift. Um, I'm, I'm using straps. I'm a big proponent of strap use as long as you can grip what you need to. So I supplement with grip work as well in the form of heavy, uh, heavy holds. And I'll probably do those twice a week for the coming four weeks. So that's on the horizon for me. Anyway, I will shift to some music. I'll let the rest of this play out. And I will talk to you guys next time. Have a great weekend. I'm off to play some Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, peace.